Coming up on Studios America, investigative journalist Steve Baker joins us to share his January 6th Blaze exclusive. The GOP presidential race loses another candidate, I'll tell you who. And I have the latest on Israel's battle against Hamas in Palestine. We'll get to all of it in 60 seconds. But first, let me tell you about Moink Box. Uh, Moink, what does that mean? Uh, it's moo plus oink. That's how they came up with Moink. And Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. You choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes or chicken breasts or pork chops, salmon fillets, and much more. And you can cancel at any time. The Moink difference is a difference that you can taste and you can feel good knowing that you're helping family farms stay financially independent as well. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com stew right now. And listeners of this particular program get free ground beef for a year. That's one year of the best ground beef you'll ever taste. But for a limited time, M-O-I-N-K box.com slash stew. It's moinkbox.com slash stew. Tonight, we're going to start by doing the Israeli reaction, and this is going to be a big story for a long time. You know, it's no real doubt what the big story is. In fact, I think everyone kind of knows. It's not a huge shock at what we're going to talk about today and what the big news is. Of course, NBC News helped us along with that this morning when they put up the big news. Israel, Israel bombards Gaza and Amazon Prime Day deals. They weren't bombing Amazon. They were talking about the Amazon Prime Day deals on the same headline as the Israel situation. It's, would you expect anything less from NBC News? Um, let me go through what's going on today so you get a sense as to where all this stands, and then we'll get into some of the reaction today, which I'm a little puzzled by, but maybe you can help me with it. Um, we stand with Israel. Biden vows U.S. support in face of vicious attacks. Now, Look, we all know Biden is one of the worst presidents of all time. Uh, he is probably the worst foreign policy president of all time. And you look at that and you say, OK, you don't expect him to be on the right side of this. Now, look, Democrats are wrong on almost everything. Occasionally you'll find a Democrat who actually understands the Israel situation. There's a few of them, believe it or not, at least are somewhat sane on the issue of Israel. And you say, well, look, we don't need this to be a partisan issue. Everyone should be supporting the people who are on the wrong side of paragliders flying in and massacring, massacring babies and raping women and uh, taking people hostage. Like, that's, that's an easy one to figure out, right? You just just get on the right side of that one. But uh, I don't know. I mean, are they doing enough here? Um, it's, it's fascinating because if they really cared about Israel, would they try to tie Ukraine funding to Israel, knowing that, you know, that's a divisive political issue? Why would you try to tie those things together if you actually cared about Israel? Hmm. White House is considering adding Ukraine to the Israel aid package which is, I don't know, a little bit inconsistent with someone who actually gives a crap, uh, you'd think, here. Now, Zelensky has come out, and he's compared the assault uh, by Hamas on Israel to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. And this is a sensitive one, because I, especially on the right right now, no one wants to hear word one about Ukraine, or certainly Zelensky. Everyone's tired of it. I will say there is something to this argument, and that Russia has done a lot of the things that Hamas has done here. You should feel, I think, the same level of revulsion that you may uh, for the people in Israel that you feel for the people in Ukraine. Now, look, Israel is a much closer ally. Ukraine has all sorts of problems in its country. And the issue here is not whether citizens uh, should be empathized with, right? Like, you can empathize with citizens in Israel and Ukraine and at the same time oppose Ukraine funding, all of it, if you want. Uh, but... Of course, they're trying to tie all these things together because that's what they do. They want one thing. They use the cri never let a crisis go to waste. Boys and girls, we learned that long ago. Now, uh, Israel is going to 
just level uh, large chunks of the Gaza Strip. Probably not enough for my liking, because honestly, I think it should just be a park. I think maybe this just gets a, all the buildings go away. Nice turf field. Make some, put some soccer fields on there for the kids to play and uh, turn it into um, pretty much an empty park that you let people in occasionally when, I don't know, you got a doubleheader for baseball. That's about all I think it should be. But gathering its dead, Israel pounds Gaza with the fierce, fiercest airstrikes ever. And that is just a part of this. This does not end with airstrikes. If it ends with airstrikes, Israel's not doing its job. And these things are going to continue to happen to them. This has to be more than that. We talked about, go back and read uh, the piece from, uh, oh my mug's out of place. Uh, go back and read the, the piece from Josh uh, Hammer yesterday. And you will see a solution that begins to make sense. Because what they're doing now, what they've been doing for 15 years with this situation, or 20 years with this situation, has to end. It has to. No more of this, hey, let's go in and, oh, we see a little inflaming. Oh, there's a little incident here. Let's, let's, let's just uh, play with the edges and let everyone go on. No. I mean, you absolutely occupying this territory is the very least that they should be doing here. And it's going to be ugly if they do it. It's not, no one's going to be happy with it. Um, I honestly think they should go farther than that. Uh, we will see if that happens. Now, Netanyahu is coming out and letting everyone know that this is different. This is a different sort of uh, oopsie. This is not your normal mistake. Israel is at war. We didn't want this war. It was forced upon us in the most brutal and savage way. But though Israel didn't start this war, Israel will finish it. Once the Jewish people were stateless, once the Jewish people were defenseless, no longer. Hamas will understand that by attacking us, they've made a mistake of historic proportions. Mm -hmm. We will exact a price that will be remembered by them and Israel's other enemies for decades to come. I hope it isn't remembered by them for decades to come, honestly, because I want them to not be around to remember it. Uh, and that's where I hope this winds up ending. Um, they, they need to be annihilated. And I'm talking about Hamas. It can no longer certainly be a political power. It's absurd they ever were. But they honestly, any member that shares any allegiance with, with uh, Hamas needs to be either removed from the nation completely or dead. It's hard to say. It makes people uncomfortable. But frankly, when you come across the border and you start murdering children and raping women, this is what you get. You know, you F around and you find out, and they're about to find out. Um, now, of course, everyone on Earth knows, right, where this comes from. It wasn't like these people in the Gaza Strip did this by themselves. We all know there was funding, there was planning done by somebody else. We all know who it is. It was Iran, among others. Uh, but look, uh, the administration's just not so sure. Watch. We just haven't seen any evidence or intelligence, as you and I are speaking right now, that points to direct Iranian participation uh, huh. in these attacks. That's so why does the Wall Street Journal have that and the White House doesn't? I, I, look, I'm not going to speak about intelligence matters and, uh, and, and what we're collecting here uh, on national TV. That said, though, Martha, make no mistake, and we've been very honest about this, Iran, of course, is complicit in these attacks because of its longstanding support to Hamas and other terrorist networks in the region. Mm, that's great. Great. Thanks for uh, updating us on that. Now, of course, yes, the Wall Street Journal has it. Also, the Washington Post has it. Hamas received weapons and training from Iran. This is according to Western intelligence officials. They don't get everything right, but this is certainly the thing that uh, this should be the position of this government. And for some reason, they're dancing around it. We all know how this happened. Go back to 2005. Uh, they, uh, they leave this area of the Gaza Strip. And the people in the area who, by the way, when polled, 90 percent of them say that violence against civilians is acceptable because the Israeli civilians are so evil. When you have a population like that, who do you think they're going to vote into office? Of course, but Hamas. Hamas also has a bit of a civil war that they wind up coming out on top on. And they wait and wait and wait and launch missiles over and 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 over again to the point where it's almost boring for outsiders to hear stories about it. I mean, can you imagine being in this country and there's rockets raining down on your society and everyone's like, eh, kind of bored with that story. Where did Taylor Swift go this weekend? Was she at a game? 
I must know. Can you imagine being in a country where that was happening? This goes so much farther than this. And finally, this can be written uh, as it should have been many years ago. Attack ends Israel's hope that Hamas might come to embrace stability. There are all sorts of reports that they were making backroom deals with Hamas all of this time to calm things down and to trust them a little bit. Well, do they trust them anymore? I think the answer to that finally is no. It better be no for the sake of the Israeli people. It better be no. Now, of course, look, yes, people are coming across the border. Yes, there's murders and rapes and decapitated babies all over the place. But what is the real threat to this country? Well, Kirby uh, was there to give us an answer to that one as well. And I think you'll agree. Given all the nuclear players in these two areas where we are now engaged on, does the president stand by that comment? Absolutely, he does. Climate change is an existential threat. It could, you know, <laughs> it actually threatens and is capable of wiping out all human life is on it? Earth uh, over is time. It? I mean, that's I don't know how more existential you can get to that. But that doesn't mean that we walk away from our obligations, our national security interests in very dangerous parts of but the John, world. You mentioned he, he two said of them. it was more frightening than a nuclear war. Is that it's more frightening than a nuclear war in this moment? The president believes wholeheartedly that climate change is an existential threat to the all of human life on the planet. That's just science. That's a fact, Martha. But it doesn't mean that we turn our back on the other challenges facing this country and our allies and partners around the world. That is absolutely not a fact. That is not science. It is not science that global warming, a one degree Celsius rise in a hundred years is the same as nuclear war. Do I even have to say these things? Is there a person on the planet, including Kirby, who actually believes them? What kind of job does this guy have? What kind of life does he have to go on television and have to say these things that he knows are untrue? I mean, what a, just a, what a douche. All right. Um, now, look, he's not the only person who is uh, reacting in important ways. Climate change, sure, big problem, but not the only problem we face here. We also face the problem of people misjudging and misnaming and not understanding appropriately trans lesbians. I know it was on the tip of your lips as I was about to say it, but a U.N.'s women's group is ignoring the assault on Israeli women and instead celebrating trans lesbians. Here is the tweet. It says, remember... Trans lesbians are lesbians, too. Let's uplift and honor every expression of love and identity. Happy International Lesbian Day. Wow. That's a hell of a message. Uh, an important message from the United Nations. Now, my understanding of what, a, again, I, I lose the, the plot on this a lot. I don't have a GPS that can point me in the right direction with some of these freaking weird stories these days. But I will tell you, trans lesbian just sounds like straight guy. Right? You're a guy. I guess you're saying you're a woman, but you're still hooking up with women. You still got your junk. Guy with junk hooking up with women just sounds like a dude. Just sounds like a straight dude. So I don't know. Maybe they can analyze that. That's science. That's fact. Uh, the Canadian media, not doing it much better than our administration. They are demanding journalists avoid the term terrorist in the Hamas coverage. And of course, it's an internationally recognized terrorist operation. But here's what they say. We have obtained what appears to be a leaked email written by CBC uh, uh, employee George Akchi instructing reporters to, one, not mention Gaza has, been occupied since, uh, uh, has not been occupied since 2005. And two, not to refer to a Palestinian terrorist as terrorists. If this is true, this employee must be fired. By the way, he's the director of journalistic standards for the CBC. I hope it's not true. We will see. The 76ers writer, uh, he's a beat writer for the Philly Voice. Uh, he's now been fired uh, because of his uh, criticism of the team's Israel tweet. And look, it's nice. Like, I, I don't need my franchises to tweet about Israel. I, like, it's nice that they do it. I agree with them, obviously, on this in almost all circumstances. I haven't seen a bad tweet from a, a team yet. Maybe there's a couple out there. But generally speaking, they've been pretty good. They've been saying, look, 
it's important to call this out as violence against Israelis. And that is the main story here. A Sixers said, we stand with the people of Israel and join them in the mourning of hundreds of innocent lives lost to terrorism at the hands of Hamas. Hashtag stand with Israel. Well, Jackson Frank wrote, this post sucks. <laughs> solidarity, solidarity with Palestine always. I should also point out, Palestine, not a place. Never been a state of Palestine, ever in all of history. Not one, never happened, not a thing, but we always stand with them. Anyway, uh, Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Boring have been a little bit of a fight with Andrew Tate uh, for his take on Israel. Um, Shapiro uh, called out, um, you know, a, uh, the idea of a truce and basically said they can F off. Um, now, Tate is a former professional kickboxer. He replied to the Daily Wire's host a post mockingly calling him Mr. Tough Guy. He said, Mr. Tough Guy, let me assure you, as someone who has done his own fighting, as opposed to excitedly encouraging others to do it for him while sitting at home on a comfy chair, peace is always worth a conversation. Oh, isn't that adorable? Uh, ben uh, wrote back, let me assure you, as someone who has not pimped women and bragged about it, that morality requires that those who rape women and kidnap children must be eradicated, not negotiated with. I think uh, Ben was uh, right on that one. Andrew Tate also tweeted uh, a very interesting take. He said, Israel forced five vaccines in everyone's arm. Forced. Rather live in Palestine and own my blood. Allah Akbar. All right. Well, look, you may be a tad too focused on uh, the vaccine. Just throwing that out there. I know a lot of people get worked up about it. Uh, maybe a little bit too much. Uh, maybe justifying rape not necessarily worth your vaccine point? I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong on that. Now, we do have, it's not all dopes uh, like this who, by the way, committed seriously, seemingly serious crimes, uh, should be noted. Um, there are also more important commentators who have come out about this issue, and they're getting canceled. And this is what always happens in these situations, right? Someone comes out with an important viewpoint, and they get canceled. This time, it's Mia Khalifa, porn star, or former porn star, Playboy fires ex-porn star Mia Khalifa for reprehensible comments supporting Hamas attack on Israel. Now, uh, brief question here, a little bit of an aside, but can you ever become an ex-porn star? Is that a thing? I feel like you just, once you're a porn star, you're just always a porn star. I don't know. And um, thank you for that. that. This is what Mia Khalifa looks like. Uh, thank you for that control room. Um, this is her appearance. Uh, so there you go. Um, but like, you, you star in a bunch of porn, you're just kind of always a porn star, right? Like, I don't know, Paul Newman's not in a lot of movies these days, but he's still a movie star, right? I don't think it goes away. And that might be a minor point here. Here's what Mia Khalifa tweeted. She said, if you look at the situation in Palestine, uh, by the way, Palestine does not exist, and not be on the side of the Palestinians, then you are the wrong side of apartheid, and history will show that in time. Now, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history or really the opposite side of history of a former porn star. I want to make sure you're lined up ideologically with all porn purveyors. Very, very important. And a lesson for you, if you happen to be young as you grow up, make sure to, before you form your viewpoints correctly, look for someone who's been in multiple uh, movies that I can't say the name of on, on, on here. And I can't really even say any of the things that happen in them. But if, uh, if she's, uh, and I'm going to stop because I, I want to give a specific reference um, to some of the things she may have been involved in in these uh, movies, but I feel like everything's going to be edited. So I can't think of anything that would actually be safe. Um, can someone please tell the freedom fighters in Palestine to flip their phone? <laughs> to flip their phones and film horizontal. That's right. You're only getting the sliver on the screen. Look, if you're going to be murdering Jews, you got to make sure you get the widescreen version. This is the problem. You know what? What if Mia Khalifa made all of her porn in the, the vertical screens? No one, would, no one would be into it. It would just be like a little sliver and you'd barely be able to see the pizza guy coming through the front door. It's just wrong. Come on, guys. When you're murdering people in cold blood, it's important to get the video aspects correct. And that's something we can all learn. We are in uh, screwed up times. 
really screwed up times and disgusting times. And I, it's hard to imagine how this all gets worse, worse. But let's go to another topic where there's been all sorts of misdeeds and uh, honestly, crazy stuff going on. Steve Baker is going to join us with his exclusive story for The Blaze coming up next. Let me tell you about Bambi. With Bambi, you can get access to your dedicated HR manager starting at just 99 bucks a month. If you have a small business, this is a freaking no-brainer. You, they've got, they're available all the time. Uh, phone, email, real-time chat, on, onboarding, uh, terminations, uh, everything goes smoothly. You need an HR person that's actually good, right? This is a really important thing. Um, but what's hard about it is they cost a lot. You're talking like 70000 a year. With Bambi's HR Autopilot, you can automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR man managers can easily cost, I mean, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year, but Bambi starts at just 99 bucks a month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now. And uh, if you type in Stu under the podcast uh, little thing there, when you sign up, it'll help the show, of course, and let Bambi know, hey, I like Stu Does America. I like you, Bambi. Uh, there's something here. B-A-M-B-E-E dot com. B-A-M-B-E-E dot com. Bambi dot com. Type in Stu under the podcast. Don't forget that. It's Bambi. All right, I want to bring Steve Baker back into the program. He's an investigative journalist, of course, Blaze Media contributor. Steve, it's been a big week for you. You came on earlier and you talked about the preview to the story. Yeah. Now the story has come out about January 6th. You can kind of finally, after all this time, let everyone know what it's about. Now, you can read the whole story, and you should, at, uh, at uh, theblaze.com. But can you kind of walk people through who we're talking about and uh, what we know? In one huge broad stroke, we have, as I mentioned weeks ago, that we have the kill shot of a actual Capitol Police officer. In fact, he was the one who was in charge of uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, own security detail. His name is Special Agent David Lazarus, and that he presented in the first Oath Keepers trial testimony that could not have taken place. I mean, that's a big accusation, obviously. Yeah. Uh, someone, because he's under oath, right? Like, that's this correct. is a major, major deal. Um, so how, how do you, I know you're looking at the video, how do you dig through all this and how can you possibly prove something like that? Well, it was something that I was on the scent of for months. In fact, it goes back over a year now when I first kind of went, there's something not right happening in this trial. And by the time the videos were opened up to a handful of us, uh, independent journalists, uh, investigative journalists that were working on January 6th related events, I was one of the first five al allowed into the, the video room there at the O'Neill building in the Capitol uh, mm -hmm. complex. And when that was made available to me, unlike some of the other guys, I wasn't having to hunt and peck around and look for a story. I knew exactly where I was going. I knew exactly who I was looking at. And when I got in there, the story actually enlarged because David Lazarus's own story was not part one of what I was looking at. Mm. He was to come later. But as it opened up, I realized that Oh my Lord, this is, this is probably the most significant of the false testimonies given in that trial and other trials because of who he is, his stature with the Capitol Police. He's not just a, you know, uh, uniformed guy standing out on the uh, property telling people where the public restroom is. Right. You know, this is the head of the Speaker of the House's security detail. And as we looked at this video and then you start the process of triangulating between cameras because it's a very it's it's a very very tedious process uh, there's there's over 1700 cameras that we had access to and then uh, the individuals that you're looking at they move out of camera shot for a while and then you have to find okay where did they go where did they go right. so you have to search all the cameras around oh there he is again and so this this process goes on for days mm -hmm. and hours and hours of of tedium and once we had what we believed was the, the, as I said earlier, the kill shot that he could not have been where he claimed to be and testified into what he claimed to have witnessed in that trial against the Oath Keeper defendants in that trial. 
then we had to start working our way backwards right. and finding everywhere that he was. And what, what we ended up tracing him all the way to the lower tunnels uh, underneath the Capitol complex that take, um, they were, he was actually escorting senators out, you know, evacuating them to the Senate buildings through the tunnel complex during the time that he claimed he witnessed this confrontational uh, moment between the Oath Keepers and Officer Harry Dunn. Yeah, let's go, let's go back to that for a minute. So we, we'll go back to the trial. He, the, what's significant about this is his word that he saw this event, right? Yes. Is really important. He's a very respected person in this uh, in the Capitol Police. He's one of the top guys, as you mentioned. Nancy Pelosi's head of security. So him saying, "I was a witness, an eyewitness to this," did a lot of damage to what the Oath Keepers were trying uh, to do. So sh tell us what he said in the trial, and then tell me again how you how you know it's wrong. Well, here's here was the first thing that he said. He said that. When he got to this stairwell, mm -hmm. it, it leads from down in the crypt area, which the crypt is directly below the, the, the great rotunda in mm -hmm. the Capitol. And when he ran up to the top of those steps, he encountered this large imposing figure by the name of Officer Harry Dunn, who was in the middle of this confrontational um, interaction with four Oath Keepers. Mm -hmm. And he actually said in the trial, when showed a picture of them, yes, that, that was them. He, he clearly identified okay. them. Mm -hmm. And what I knew from looking at evidence is that there was something not quite right about that because as he described all of the, in great detail, the interaction, he described that he went past them three or four times during that interaction and that every time he went back and forth, it was always confrontational. And then he described that he was also rescuing 11 or 12, that's his quote from the trial, under, under oath, of Pelosi staffers who were locked in an office. Now, he may have done that at some other point in the day, but he very specifically made that statement that it happened during the Harry Dunn Oath Keeper interaction. And when I started looking at the videos, he's never in any of those videos during that time. We can see from CCTV that he never crosses, and he's dressed very distinctively. Uh, he's not dressed like a Capitol Police officer. He's wearing a suit and tie and a long overcoat because it was the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. And then we found him on video running back and forth, and then we were able to trace him to where he actually was during that time because what he said is he said under oath that when he heard on the Capitol Police radios that shots had been fired at 2.44, PM. Mm -hmm. That was a, basically within seconds of when Ashley Babbitt was killed by um, Lieutenant Michael Byrd. That that's when he turned around from being underneath the Senate office buildings across the street and that he started heading back to towards the House chamber. 244, that was already when the interaction between the Oath Keepers and Harry Dunn was taking place. And right then you go, wait a minute, you can't be over here and claim you saw this happening here. You certainly couldn't have seen it three or four times. So that's why we knew to start looking. We knew that he wasn't in the, in the camera right. frame. He, he never showed up in the camera during that interaction. And we knew that he claimed he was here at this time. So that's when we started tracing him through the complex of back and forth between the CCTV cameras. And we literally trailed him all the way back. Mm. And he didn't arrive until several minutes after the Oath Keepers were gone. Mm. So he claims he's an eyewitness to an incident yep. that he was not an eyewitness to. And he says this under oath. That's a big deal, right? It's a big deal, it's especially because he was corroborating a rather shaky testimony already being delivered by Officer Dunn. Mm. Well, so what, because I mean, this is obviously bad for Lazarus, right? The, the Nancy Pelosi's head of security. This looks really bad. He's not even in this area. He's obviously making this up, mm -hmm. probably trying to strengthen, you know, uh, uh, another, uh, you know, Harry Dunn's uh, uh, testimony, right? Right. But like, so do we don't know what happened in this interaction? I mean, do, do we not see that, the interaction on camera? Do we? It is a very difficult thing to see because there's not an actual capital camera on that spot where okay. the Oath Keepers and Harry Dunn 
met. But there's a lot of other cell phone cameras from protesters and even a couple of independent journalists who were passing by. Now, had they been passing by and realized that this was a, was a really contentious thing, right. they would have stopped and really captured it. But it wasn't contentious. That's the problem. The four Oath Keepers are clearly seen standing with their back to Harry Dunn as he's standing at the top of the stairs carrying a big you know, automatic rifle. And he's standing behind them. And you can see Oath Keepers holding their arms out and holding the crowd back from him. So those moments are captured in really quick yeah. frames mm -hmm. as these as these uh, cameras are walking by them. But here's the here's the other thing, Stu, is there are other cameras that are held on this event for a long period of time, and we've never seen those videos. We can actually see from these other independent journalists just passing by. We can actually see the the, the screen of cell phone cameras recording that entire ev entire event, but those. Those never videos been have been never been produced. They do exist, we think. Well, I would think that they do. Yeah. Uh, one of these individuals in particular is himself an independent uh, journalist by the name of Sean Weitzman. He was he took a plea deal. He was uh, despite his you know he did no violence. He did no property damage. He was in there covering the story, and uh, he had to take a plea deal for the you know all of the the four basic misdemeanors, and then. Um, his devices were conf confiscated, and that video that he had and was live streaming to Facebook has never been produced into what is, evidence. What is his account of, uh, of this interaction? He said, well, uh, his account is, is full of four-letter words, but he, <laughs> he says that uh, what has been presented in the court is a load of you-know-what. Right. Oh, gosh, so is it because they the oath keepers are a name that people know it's yeah. it's a sort of to some people a scary group like you know the, the proud boys the mm -hmm. oath keepers they're often paired together yeah. uh, sometimes unfairly maybe yeah um, and is it is that the motivation here by the state they're, they're trying to say like we need this group away they were organizing this overturning of the overthrowing of the government and their in their story and whether this interaction happened or not, we need to make sure that these people go away. Here's, here's the two primary differences between the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. Proud Boys like knocking heads. Yeah. They like showing up where Antifa is and engaging. Mm -hmm. And they have a long history of that. The Oath Keepers, in their 13-year history, with over 35,000 dues-paying members, had never had a single incident of violence in hundreds and thousands of operations in which they did disaster relief, provided security for VIPs, or um, security for businesses, mm -hmm. minority businesses during riots, BLM riots of 2020. Right. So they have a long history of that. And the problem that the government has with an organization like that is that when they show up, they do wear the scary looking militia stuff mm -hmm. because some of their members and some of, as with some of the Proud Boys, they've been stabbed by Antifa. So they wear breastplates, they, they wear uh, the tactical looking gear. But these Oath Keepers were actually sitting in the VIP section at the ellipse during Trump's speech that day granted access by the Secret Service. And then they were escorting VIPs over to the Capitol mm. during the march after the speech was over to the Capitol because there were stages and other events planned and scheduled and permitted by the Capitol Police on the Capitol property that day. So they were escorting their VIPs over. There was even Congress members scheduled to speak on the property that day. And, and this is what the Oath Keepers were there for. But the government instead said, and this is an exact quote by uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Nessler at the beginning of the trial in his opening statement. He pointed at those five Oath Keepers that were in that first trial, including the founder, Stuart Rhodes, and he said, they were the leaders of the attack on the Capitol. Hmm. They weren't even on the property yet when the Capitol was attacked. So why? Well, like the, the, if this organization is you know, maybe not aligned with every Democrat, but but harmless and maybe does, does some good things. Why are they targeting them? Why would they decide to go to these lengths uh, to to try to put these people in prison? Do you think that this current administration, this government, this current spirit of the age wants an organization of 40,000 members, 35,000 and growing of former law, former and current law enforcement? and former and current retired military, mm -hmm. or current military, 
who have sworn to keep and continue keeping their oaths after their term of duty and after they stop receiving their paychecks from government? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah. And so this was an opportunity of being in the wrong place at the wrong time that the government was able to frame these guys up and, um, and unfortunately they did a great job of it mm -hmm. because all you had to do it was in front of a DC jury and it's a fait accompli. Yeah, it's over. Uh, okay, so I know you, this is a huge story. Make sure you go read it at thebillies.com from Steve Baker, but also you have, this is not the last story. No. You've got more coming, yeah. some more with with your personal story and what else? Yeah, th there's there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a, a lot of branches to this story and we're, we're going after all of them. Uh, part two of the story will be a continuance of this done Lazarus interaction mm -hmm. and then we will also continue the process of, of showing additional manipulated evidence and testimonies uh, by the government in these trials. Lots to come from Steve Baker, investigative journalist and at Belize Media and a Belize Media contributor as well. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Stephen. Thanks for all your hard work. I know it's been a year of a, a lot and we do really appreciate it uh, because without you, we wouldn't know any of this stuff. Thanks, Stu. I really appreciate it. If you ever bought or sold a home, you know, honestly, it can be hell. It really can be. It's one of the, I don't know, you feel so uneasy. It's like buying jewelry. You never, know, you never know if the thing you're getting is even real. Is that really a diamond or not? Is it really a house that I'm going to love for the next 30 years or not? Is this really an area I'm going to love, my, I'm going to wait, run and raise my kids in or not? That's a difficult question for everyone to go through. And if you don't have somebody on your side helping you out through every part of that decision, it can be really, really daunting. And that's why realestateagentsitrust.com exists. Now, of course, it also exists to make, you, make sure you get the most for your house when you sell it. Uh, you need to have a be the best real estate agent in your area on both sides of that transaction. Don't go into one of these things without somebody on your side. You need a buying agent. You need a selling agent. Uh, when you do that, you're able to maximize the value for yourself and make sure that you're, you're going to be happy with this transaction for years and years to come. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. Check it out now, realestateagentsitrust.com. This is a company that Glenn started years ago, and it's a free service to you. realestateagentsitrust.com. You know, watching the coverage from the mainstream media has to kind of shock you a little bit. Now, I've seen some decent reporting from the Middle East, but man, it really is surprising when you can't get on the right side of something this clear. When you're, you know, you're echoing basically the squad members and, and their commentary, but guys, in, as a news report, we're seeing this over and over again in mainstream media. This is going to get much, much worse, particularly on this story, because the way these cycles work is you have a couple days where people are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe these children and women were assaulted and raped and murdered. And that fades. The emotion fades, right? And then you get a situation where uh, people are justifying uh, their positions as, uh, oh, maybe Israel's being too tough this time. This is going to turn on Israel. It's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. So if you want coverage that's actually going to be good, that's going to tell you the truth, you've got to be a member of Blaze TV. This, it's time. Uh, we're going into election season as well. You're going to get great coverage from Blaze TV. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to sign up. Use the promo code Stu. We'd really appreciate you getting on board. Look, we love, if you're watching on YouTube, you're watching on Pluto, on podcasts, whatever, we love that you're there. If that's all you can do, that's fine. But if you have a couple extra bucks, you can throw it toward good news coverage that will actually help the country and not destroy it. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. What would it be like if all of a sudden a global medication supply chain of antibiotics just kind of disappeared before our eyes? Actually, this is kind of happening right now. I was just reading a story the other day that I don't know, 300 plus medications we're having shortages with in the United States. I had to get the Jason Medical guy on. We, we should have him on because the bottom line here is that if your antibiotics go away, if your medications go away, you're in deep crap. It's not, it's, it's part of your preparation uh, uh, ideal here. You know, you could talk about water, you talk about food, of course you have to have those things. But you also have to have medicine. This is important. The Jace case from Jace Medical is a great way to keep yourself prepared for the worst. It's a pack of five different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses. Things like respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, and so much more. Shortages, yes, you'll, you'll be prepared for that. 
traveling as well. Throw this thing in your suitcase when you go overseas. You don't have to deal with those crazy healthcare systems over there if you come down with something basic. Go to jacemedical.com. Enter the code STU at checkout for a discount. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace case from jacemedical.com. Joe Biden is... I mean, you can fill that blank with a million different things, right? Incoherent, way too old, uh, a terrible president, on and on and on and on and on. I bet you didn't think it was going to end this way. Joe Biden is our third black president, which, in case you're losing track, number one was Bill Clinton in this fever dream. Number two is Barack Obama. And number three is Joe Biden. Now, not mentioned is Donald Trump, who had the what, the lowest unemployment rate for African Americans in our nation's history, you think, and not to mention was rap, uh, was featured in about 9,000 rap songs and had incredible ratings with the African American community before he was president, but he's not the black president. It's Bill Clinton and now Joe Biden. There's an incoherent case made. I'll, say, I'll spare you from it. Um, another guy who may be interested in the fact that there's already been three black presidents is Will Hurd. Now, Will Hurd uh, is an African-American as well. He was running for president and uh, now he's not running for president. So he will not be the fourth black president we've ever had, but he has uh, suspended his presidential bid on Monday and made an endorsement. That endorsement went to Nikki Haley. Uh, so Haley is the beneficiary of the zero percent that Will Hurd had which means she'll go from like 6% to 6%. Although, as Glenn pointed out uh, to me in the radio program this morning, if they put the zero after the six, she's up to 60%. So I don't know how math works, but that seems pretty good. And by the way, you need to know about this very important. Joe Biden's younger brother, Frank, has admitted the naked selfie on guys with iPhones gay dating site is genuine. Yes. I was on the edge of my seat wondering about that. Is that a genuine photo of Frank Biden? Uh, yes. Apparently, he says his uh, phone must have been hacked, which, of course, is what everyone seems to say when bad things happen to them. I will say, um, look, I, I don't happen to be part of the gay community, although, uh, you know, I'm sure it's wonderful. But I mean, guys with iPhones.com can't be top notch, right? Like that's not the, is that not the place you go? I mean, guys with iPhones.com could be a lot of people. Uh, why is a guy with an iPhone uh, on a, why does that mean a gay dating site? I don't understand. But if you have an iPhone and you'd like to participate with Frank over at guys with iPhones.com, I don't know, maybe change your name because it doesn't seem like uh, this has worked out all that well for Frank, who, by the way, yes, younger brother, all of everyone in this family seems to be in on bizarre, corrupt things. Now, this might be Frank might be the best one. He's just on a website with his, his junk hanging out. That might be the best possible Biden. We'll see. OK, so here's what happened. A bunch of kids, fourth graders, wanted to watch a movie in class, and they were able to, and they decided they wanted to watch Winnie the Pooh. No big deal. And Winnie the Pooh, it's a classic, right? And they decided they want to watch Winnie the Pooh. Teacher puts on Winnie the Pooh, sits back at their desk, I don't know, probably flipping through the iPhone as this is going on. Kids start complaining about the movie. They don't want to watch it. And, of course, if you have kids, this happens all the time. They say they want something, and then they say they don't want it. And, you know, so he's kind of ignoring them. Goes on for 20 or 30 minutes. Before anyone realizes that it wasn't the classic Winnie the Pooh cartoon, it was instead homicidal Winnie the Pooh movie that was shown to <laughs> Miami Springs school children. Now, if you don't remember this, it's called Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. And, it, you know, Winnie the Pooh went into public domain, so you can do anything with these characters. They decided to make a horror movie out of it. And it includes scenes like this one, uh, where Pooh chops the head off of a victim and blood spurts out. Also, stabbing, face ripping, neck slicing, arm snapping, whipping, eyeballs popping out. Uh, also, a lady being fed into a, a wood chipper and uh, breasts uh, being shown during the murders. I will say it's better than drag queens shaking their ass in front of kids' faces, so at least we got that going on. <laughs> 